so this is Dr. Whip again talking about spinal cord injury. I think I was cut off at the last one, which is fine, because now we're going to go back to that 16-year-old patient um, who had the car accident and is somewhere a thoracic, likely complete spinal cord injury. And so now what do we do with him? Now he's in the hospital. Um, he's already having some dysautonomia symptoms. How do we manage this kid and move forward? So we're going to talk about the complications that can occur with spinal cord injury early and some of the chronic ones connect it with the pathophysiology management diagnosis of spinal shock, which is critical in the early stages to understand. We're going to look at early to chronic management of medical issues with spinal cord injury, know how to monitor for spasticity, know how to recognize emergent situations, and know a really good resource for information if you ever have a spinal cord injury and you have forgotten this lecture, which you will all do, right? So, acute management issues. We've already talked about the first one with spinal stability. So we've got to know surgical options. If there's not surgery, do we need a brace? Do we need them to be in a C collar? Do we need them to be in what we call a TLSO, which is a thoracic lumbar sacral orthotic, um, which is kind of a turtle shell brace if you've seen those. Um, they might even need a halo. If you have a really high level cervical injury with C1, C2 affected, they'll actually put screws into the scalp connected to four um, steel connectors down to the shoulders and so they're actually completely immobile in the cervical spine because even with your C collars you can still move your head a little bit and we want no movement if they have a high injury like that that can't otherwise be stabilized um, because it is no fun to be pithed. Now, Respiratory issues are critical and they will occur in patients with lower injuries than you would think. So we know C3, 4, 5, keep the diaphragm alive. That's great. That's the phrenic nerve. That's just the diaphragm. The diaphragm um, contracts um, to let us take in a breath and then relaxes to help us get the right um, expiratory pressure to breathe out. Um, it's usually the last thing to be affected in a neuromuscular disorder, which is what I deal with. So I know how bad expiratory weakness is. So what about your scalenes and your intercostal muscles and your abdominal muscles? Because all those help you breathe out well. That affects your cough. That affects your ability to get rid of secretions that are building up and to keep a cold from turning into a pneumonia. They're critical. And even injuries as low as the, like T10, T11, where your thoracic spine is injured and your belly muscles are weak, can affect breathing. So we really have to keep a close eye on um, their lungs because it's easy for them to develop atelectasis, which is where the little bitty airways collapse, little bitty bubbles collapse at the bottom of the lungs. That sets you up for infection, and it also sets you up to not have the greatest breathing ability. Expiratory muscles are key to keeping that respiratory, um, that respiration going in and out adequately. Um, it's critical to when you lay flat at night because we all breathe a little more shallowly at night. All our contents in the belly that are under the diaphragm shift up into the lung space at night when we lie flat. And all of that can make it harder for them to maintain oxygen levels and make sure they're getting good respiratory function at night. Um, so we're not just talking about oxygen, we're not just talking about ventilation for diaphragmatic weakness, but really any injury involving the trunk, we should be thinking about their ability to have a good cough, good airway clearance, and to avoid the atelectasis, which if you've had any medical lecture you know, from pulmonary, you know is just the, work, the beginning of the end for um, hospital patients as far as leading down to the road of some kind of pneumonia or infection complication. Um, the third one we've touched on with our 16-year-old friend who had the car accident is autonomic instability. So the blood pressure can go up and down, pulse, temperature, um, they can get dizzy when they sit up, they can have arrhythmias. This mostly occurs in patients with a T6 level or above, and our patient must be somewhere in there. 
but it can really, the, some of the blood pressure and pulse issues can occur in any patient with a spinal cord injury because they go into a shock, which means all of their blood vessels lose that auto autonomic control, local control. So there's no nerves telling the capillaries to constrict when they get the message that you're sitting up and your blood pressure starts to drop and they automatically help the blood vessels constrict to send the blood up to your brain. That's not happening in spinal shock. Those little nerve connections aren't working. They're in shock. Um, they're too busy being surprised that they're not working to do anything. So most patients can have some dizziness, especially up front. So we have to watch that and do other things to help them, like put on compression hose and maybe an abdominal binder, anything to help with that external compression of the vessels to keep them from getting dizzy um, when they sit up. There's also, we talked about the risk for clotting, and so this is when we start the Lovenox. If they have some kind of bleeding contraindication, like they've had uh, a subdural hematoma from a comorbid brain injury, then we at least have to be doing um, the uh, compression stockings and the sequential compressive devices where they kind of inflate uh, to put pressure on the muscles and the calves and um, intermittently. Um, those feel pretty nice, actually, by the way. It's kind of like getting a massage, although some patients hate them. Um, there's also comorbid issues. So we, all, we very rarely have an isolated spinal cord injury. Yeah, gunshot wound, maybe. But usually we're going to have some kind of fracture or an abdominal injury or a splenic laceration or a liver laceration, for example, or a bowel perforation or um, the, a brain injury. Something else is going on, and so we have to accommodate for that because any kind of painful sensation is going to drive any response um, by pulse and blood pressure so forth. Um, really cattywampus, especially if they're already having a little trouble. Plus, you have a patient who can't tell you if they're hurting. So it's very common to have occult fractures that get missed in the early period um, because the patient can't tell you if they're hurting and it takes a while to really see until they're up and moving or we're trying to move them that something is red or swollen or having a deformity. Um, so what is spinal shock? So following a spinal cord injury for a few days to a few weeks, there is a period of time where all the reflexes are suppressed. So there is the spinal cord injury itself, which disconnects um, what the brain is trying to tell our body to do from the stuff that actually can do it, um, bowel, bladder, muscle, so forth. Um, but you don't have any reflex arcs, so you, you lose your stretch reflexes, um, you lose your gut reflexes, and so peristalsis and um, the gastrocolic reflex where you eat and it helps your belly move, or um, a rectal filling reflex where the rectum fills full and you constrict those muscles to evacuate your bowel, all those are not present for a while, and that can definitely affect the patient's ability to eat and have a normal transition um, to void, and that can be very uncomfortable. It can cause an ileus. Um, you have flaccidity in your bladder muscle, which we talked about. That holding chamber becomes flaccid, although the sphincter stays tight rigid. Um, you don't have goosebumps. You don't sweat below the level of the injury. And as we talked about, those little capillaries and the blood flow lose that communication temporarily to say, hey, I'm sitting up. I need to constrict this or I'm going to pass out. Um, so we have to do a lot of strategies to help the patients early on. The average is a few weeks of spinal shock. The first reflex to return will be the bulbar cavernosis reflex, and this is actually not a bad one to check early on because they probably have a Foley, and you're having to monitor their rectal tone and sensation anyway, and so you tug on their Foley catheter and see if their, um, their rectum, you have an anal wink, basically, if you fill out a contraction in the anus. That's the first one. You will then start to see probably some muscle stiffness or spasticity, which we'll talk about. The reflexes will start to come back on the lower extremities. Um, and the bladder will stop being flaccid. And that detrusor muscle will start getting tight and jumpy. Um, this is, of course, without regulation. So the brain is not controlling these reflexes anymore. They go rogue. Um, you do also get the blood vessel tone back, at least part of it.
spasticity also helps with blood flow return um, because the muscles are tight and so they kind of squish on the little veins too to help the blood return. Um, sweating tends to still be above the level of the lesion. So now we have rogue reflexes and we still have some complications that we talked about last time. So we have to watch the breathing. Um, do they need a trach in event? Do they have a high enough injury for that? Um, we've got to prevent infection and so we get them to do those. Um, you see every relative in the hospitals have one where you have to either breathe in or breathe out in the little tube to keep your lungs inflated. We can take that a step further and instead of just doing like a nebulizer treatment, which is just medication, do medication with a pressurized breathing treatment to help open up the lungs. Um, there's also things called cough assist that help you get um, a puff of air to inflate your lungs and then help you suck out the secretions as you're coughing. So we watch for that. We have to be on the hunt all the time for clots, which includes the risk of pulmonary embolism, and we have to be very aggressive about infections. The bladder. So we don't have a way for the patient to control their sphincter. They can't control their external sphincter. The internal sphincter is tight um, and won't relax. And so we have to drain the bladder manually. So that at first is with a Foley catheter. Um, and that is helpful because they're probably on a bunch of fluid resuscitation and there will be no way to keep up with the fluid as long as they aren't IV fluids. Um, so once they're off fluids and probably close to transitioning to rehab, we move them to an in and out catheter. Why can't we keep them with a Foley? Well, number one, they're cumbersome. And so these patients are going to be living with this for the rest of their lives. Foley catheters have a higher risk of infection. They have a higher risk of bladder stones. They have a higher risk of bladder cancer long term. And this is going to be long term. Um, it also means that your bladder is constantly being drained. And think about it. You're constantly draining a sac that is trying to contract. So that detrusor muscle, once you get out of spinal shock, is twitchy, it's contracting, it's spastic, just like the muscles are spastic. And if there's nothing in the bladder enough to stretch it, if you're never getting a full bladder to stretch that muscle, it's going to contract down and contract down and contract down to the size of a walnut. Well, what if the patient then wants to go in an in-and-out cath? you can't have any volume left in that bladder. So we really like to transition to where you have a catheter, it's still um, typically, and they insert it, they drain their bladder, and take it out. And they do that every, try to get it to about every six hours, and then eventually to every six during the day where they don't have to cath overnight. Um, if they stay to around two liters of fluids a day, that usually works out pretty well. What you don't want is to go over 400 cc's in an adult bladder because what we said would happen would happen. It leaks. It leaks out, so they have incontinence, and it leaks up. And so you can have um, reflux into the kidneys that can cause big problems. These patients are going to need long-term kidney ultrasounds every year. They're going to need medications to calm down that detrusor muscle. So it's not spazzing all the time and causing them to leak. Um, and they also need, after about 10 years, to have bladder scopes because even with in and out catheters, they're going to have a risk of infection, a risk long-term that's a little higher than the normal average population of bladder stones and bladder cancer. Um, bowel, so we don't want them to be constipated, so that's number one. This, the second one is one that I can't get anybody to ever understand at first take, including patients. We have to give them control of as much as we can. We want them to be independent. We don't want them pooping in their pants all the time. Having accidents is never appropriate once you're toilet trained. And so it's critical for us to give them some tools to have some control over their bowel movements. Just making it soft doesn't give them control. We want to time it. So what we like to do in rehab is give them and then teach them to do at home is to give them a suppository after supper. So what that does is it lets them have the gastrocolic reflex once spinal shock is over. So your bowels move after you eat. It's a stimulation. Your bowels also tend to move. You tend to evacuate your rectum um, when your rectum is full. And after spinal shock, that rectum will have that reflex again. So you put the suppository in it. 
it expands the, the material in the rectum, gives it a stimulus to empty out. Some patients struggle with this. Some of them eventually need colostomies to be able to manage their bowel and stay continent. Some of them are able to go through a procedure where they can flush their bowels um, by connecting, um, a, using their appendix really as a connection to the ileum and threading it up through the umbilicus. So you can catheterize the umbilicus, flush it with water, and then be done. Spina bifida patients do this because they kind of have a floppy bowel their injury is way down in the lumbar spine, and so you don't have upper motor neuron bowel, you have lower motor neuron bowel, and so they don't have any of those reflexes to work with, and they have a really, really hard time with bowel control, and so they do that. It's called an ACE procedure, A-C-E, look it up. It's pretty interesting, um, and that can help them, you know, every couple days they flush out their bowel and they don't have accidents, because that's a pretty impactful thing if we can give these patients back their continence. Um, skin, you can't feel it. This causes problems we don't even think about. Uh, not only do they have a risk of pressure sores when they're in the hospital on their sacrum, but they have a risk um, over the ischial tuberosities if they're sitting in their chair and they don't have the right cushion. Um, they have a risk on their legs or their hips if they're pushed against anything or an inappropriate chair for a period of time. If they get new shoes that are too tight, they can have pressure control issues. If they get new blue jeans um, that are a little thicker or have a thick um, seam, that they're not used to. They can have pressure from that. They have to do skin checks every day, everywhere, every time before and after they get dressed. This is a constant maintenance for them. Because once they get a wound, and let's say they get it on their sacrum or their ischial tuberosity, their mobility is then going to be limited. And they're going to get into the cycle of having wounds and maybe osteomyelitis, and then they have to have surgery, and then they have to be immobile. And that just takes away from the time they can be up and going and independent. So, spasticity comes back with the reflexes. I think sometimes um, people find it difficult to translate this into the, for the family because the family may see this as a return of movement um, and that can be difficult to explain. My best explanation is that the brain's not talking to the muscle anymore and so it's not telling it to have the right tone because we all have muscle tone. It can be um, where we can sit up and move around without having to fight stiffness or we're not floppy jello, okay? Um, we have a very moderate amount of tone and when you lose that overriding control from the brain, then it goes out of control. We don't know what normal is. Our muscles don't know what's normal and they go overkill. So the reflexes are crazy. Um, you know, you'll have clonus, you'll have upgoing toes. The reflexes are when they even just checking reflexes are stretching. The ankle may send the whole leg into clonus. This kind of tone that's very severe. Sometimes all of a sudden the patient will flex up into like a fetal position. Sometimes it makes them straighten out really fast. This can throw them off. This can actually throw them out of their chair. This can wake them up from sleep. This can be painful. This can be limiting to movement. What if they're trying to move from their bed to their wheelchair and an extension tone pops in? So they're this in spinal cord this is usually pretty severe so we have to find out a way to treat this not all tone is bad sometimes you can have a little bit of tone that helps you let's say we have an incomplete spinal cord injury and they have tone in their quadriceps so their their legs tend to be a little stiff right this actually gives them a little better control at the knee if they want to walk Yes, it can be looking a little stiff, but it can help them transfer, it can help them stand. Um, so some tone can be helpful. It also helps with the muscle pump, getting that um, blood back up to the brain. Um, and so it helps kind of maintain some muscle bulk. Um, but we don't want it interrupting sleep. We don't want it hurting. We don't want it impacting function. And we don't want them to get stuck in a position and form a contracture because of it. So we have oral medication muscle relaxers that are an option. This usually is different from the muscle relaxers we use to treat back pain. Um, the receptors are different and the purpose is different. We're looking for more widespread um, efficacy. Baclofen is usually first line. 
if the oral medications are not controlling it enough or if they're causing sedation because they all make you sleepy, um, then you can actually put the baclofen in a pump, implant the pump under the subcutaneous tissue in the belly, thread a catheter around to the spine, and give a constant source of intrathecal baclofen. This is actually very, very helpful for spinal cord injury. You will rarely see this in a hospital basis. I have had patients that had prolonged stays need a pump in the hospital because they were just so miserable and they do really well. Um, pumps are really cool. You can um, program them with a magnet um, to go up or down. You can have them get more medicine at night, more in the day. Um, so you can put them on a flex dose. It does have to be, like you take the old medicine out and put the fresh medicine in close to the time. You don't want these to ever be empty. So if you have a non-compliant patient, don't put them in a pump because if the pump goes dry, like they're not coming in for their refills, they can go into seizures and die. So we want a compliant patient. Um, but if you keep up with it and they keep it changed out, these pumps last about seven years. You might need a refill every three months, maybe every six. That's a pretty nice thing for spinal cord. Spinal cord injury patients tend to have too diffuse of spastic, like their spasticity is affecting too many muscle groups too severely for Botox to be an option. Botox is a toxin. It's very helpful. I do it every Wednesday all day. Lots of patients benefit from it. It is best if you can give the right dose of Botox to just a few muscles, but there is a dose limit. Number one, for what the patient can tolerate. Number two, what insurance will pay for. And if they're flexing and extending and throwing themselves out of their chair when they transfer, that's too much tone for Botox. We would make them toxic before it's beneficial. And so that's why the pump is a little quicker option. Um, in these type of patients. We do have to be aware spinal cord injury patients tend to get spinal cord injuries from inappropriate behaviors. That's a common cause. They're either drunk or high and they get in a car accident or they decide to jump off a bridge or um, they ramp off the um, porch or I mean they have high risk behaviors. For example, one of my 16-year-old patients in rehab several years ago was smoking pot on the roof and fell off and got a spinal cord injury. Now, he told us that he was moving furniture from the second floor out onto the tree in the front yard, but we figured it out. Um, so, in some patients just get unlucky. Okay, it's not always their fault. Sometimes they're putting up Christmas lights and they fall. You know, car accidents happen and they're not fair. I have a friend of a family member who was walking on a trail with his wife and a tree fell on him. And yeah, things can be freak too, but those are gonna be the patients that have a little better coping skills than the ones that are already not working, not paying attention in school on some drugs. And so you have kind of a mixed group. So keep in mind that patients may decide to self-medicate with marijuana. Marijuana actually works for spasticity pretty well. Um, it is not, however, legal in Mississippi. Um, and you have higher risk behavior, higher um, addiction potential in some of these patients. So you have to be very careful, even if we can get it to be legal for some of our patients that really do need it. Um, pain and spinal cord injury, this is a really common issue. This is a, a big problem. Spinal cord injuries hurt. I, I really don't know if you have a spinal cord injury patient who will ever be free from pain. Um, they tend to get used to some of the nerve symptoms and the nerve abnormalities over time. Um, we can obviously give them medicines for that nerve pain, but it can also be difficult to localize pain in a spinal cord injury because you're dealing with varying levels of accurate sensation. So here's how to think about it and break it down. I think if you can organize your thoughts and your assessment, it's all for the better. So let's think about pain above the level. So above where they're injured, what are we gonna see? We're probably gonna see overuse injuries. So if you're pushing a wheelchair all the time, your shoulders are gonna hurt and get tired. You might then develop a compressive neuropathy at the elbow. You might then get carpal tunnel. Um, so you might then get to query. So you might get a tenon tendonitis um, at the elbow or the wrist or the thumb. So overuse, overwork injuries are probably what you're gonna see here. Um, at the level of the injury is the most sensitive level for pain 
neuropathic pain, even over time, that's going to be the most highly sensitive area. And so we have to be aware of that. Um, you can have pain, obviously, from whatever bony issue happened or from a spinal surgery that occurred and the incision or from that nerve getting hurt right there. So they can even have a banding um, at the level of injury that's painful. Below the level is where it gets really tricky because the other two you can understand pretty well and localize pretty well. Below the level, what if they are T5 and they have an appendicitis or an ingrown toenail or a bladder infection? So they're not going to feel, they're not going to have a right upper, I'm sorry, <laughs> right lower quadrant pain and rebound pain. They're not going to have right upper quadrant pain um, and uh, with the gallbladder. They're, you know, um, if they have an ingrown toenail, they're not going to feel it in their toe. The bladder infection, they're not going to have burning when they urinate. They're not going to be able to feel. So you have to realize the symptoms that they may have. Any painful injury or any infection is going to show up, number one, is increased spasticity. Okay, and their spasms are going to get worse, and they'll be able to tell you that. Number two, if you have a patient that has T6 or above, and their autonomic system is dysregulated, you can have a real problem with pain below the injury. It's called autonomic dysreflexia, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. But basically what happens is if the body knows it's hurting, there is a pain signal. It's just not getting to the brain. So instead, the body, you're not responding to it, you're not addressing it, and so the body goes into this severe sympathetic response that shoots these patients' blood pressure up. Um, it can cause headaches, flushing above the level, sweating above the level of injury, and it, you can have these patients stroke out from these blood pressure issues. So we need to recognize it as a medical emergency, get their blood pressure down, with something short acting and figure out what's going on. Is their bladder not emptying? Have they not cathed? Do they have an infection? Are they impacted? Do they have an ingrown toenail? So you think bowel bladder skin, um, yeah, bowel bladder skin first, and then you start looking in the belly and see what's causing these patients autonomic dysreflexia, and you keep that blood pressure down until they're better. The other thing to remember in spinal cord is that these patients' blood pressure is going to suddenly run pretty low. Not suddenly. Spinal shock, it's going to be low. And then it tends to stay around the 80s or 90s systolic. Um, maybe 40s or 50s diastolic. And that's going to be their normal. How do you know? Because they're going to be looking at you with no dizziness or any kind of problem. And they're, that's going to be their blood pressure, 90 over 60 or something. Um, so if they come in and they have a blood pressure of 110 over 70, that may be a problem. So just kind of have a lower threshold of thinking about autonomic dysreflexia. Your blood pressure doesn't have to be 200 over 110 like it would be in a, a normal hypertensive emergency. It can be a normal blood pressure and still be a problem, uh, especially if they are having a headache, they're having sweating, they're having symptoms. Um, spasticity is usually not painful below the level of an injury. Neuropathic pain is. Unlike a stroke where it really has a little more crossover, and so neuropathic pain control is important. If a child is injured before the age of 10, they're not as likely to have neuropathic pain. If anybody's interested in peds, I'll give you that tidbit. Um, so what are some risks? What are some warning signs? Um, number one, or do they have spelling? Okay, dependent edema can happen. That's okay, but you need to make sure you're not seeing redness and like a home sign where you stretch, you dorsiflex their foot and they're hurting um, or having increased spasticity, if they have some kind of reaction to that, it's going to be a little muted in a spinal cord injury patient. Um, but asymmetric swelling should always get an ultrasound. Usually they'll need an ultrasound before they go to rehab to you and we really get them up and moving. Um, just to make sure we're not going to, we don't have a deep vein thrombosis, we can push up and cause a PE. Um, over a joint, or even, uh, uh, usually it's around a joint, heterotopic ossification is bone that is laid down in places it's not supposed to. It usually happens around joints. It happens after brain injury and spinal cord injury, uh, particularly if there is also associated fractures. One of some of the most common places in spinal cord are the hips and the elbows. Um, this can be a problem because if they have this bony formation outside the joint, it can actually 
lock the joint up where they can't move. And this can either lock them in hip in a neutral hip position or hip flexion, and that can limit their ability to get up and sit in a chair. Um, usually this will be swelling and pain, especially with range of motion. That's in the early stages. You can treat it with bisphosphonates then. Um, if they've been sick or they're in a hospital ICU in a life-threatening situation for a prolonged period of time, you may not see it because you're not moving the joints like you would if they were already in rehab. Um, but you might then have a joint that you can't range um, that's really stiff. And so I'd have a low threshold again of checking x-rays, seeing if there's an occult fracture that we missed and something didn't heal right, or if there's bone that's keeping the joint from moving. This can be pretty impressive, actually. Um, occult fracture or superficial trauma, again, we always have to remember they can't feel things get missed when you're trying to save somebody's life. So... A little finger fracture, a wrist fracture may not be a big deal in the beginning, and they're probably going to be kind of swollen anyway, so it'll be really hard to localize. So keep that in mind. Um, headaches, see what they are. It can be a migraine, if they have a history of headaches. It can be benign, yes, but it can also be autonomic dysreflexia. The way to tell autonomic dysreflexia from orthostatic hypotension headache is that in orthostatic hypotension, the blood pressure is, of course, down, and the pulse goes up to compensate. In autonomic dysreflexia, the blood pressure control is from the thoracic nerves, and so it's cattywampus, and it can go up and respond appropriately. The carotid baroceptors in the neck are typically spared in a spinal cord injury, which means even though the blood pressure is trying to go up in a sympathetic response, the baroreceptors feel the pressure in that carotid artery and it'll keep your pulse from escalating up also. So you wind up getting a pattern that's flipped from orthostatic hypotension. Um, there's a few things that can abdominal, cause abdominal pain and they can have vague discomfort even with a spinal cord injury. Constipation is always on the list. They can wind up with a gastric ulcer from all the stress and so forth, maybe premorbid issues. Um, that can be easy to miss. Obviously, bladder inf infections or a kidney stone are up there. Hypercalcemia is something you might not think about. Bone reabsorption and building and so forth gets off, especially in young men with spinal cord injuries. And so checking a calcium level and monitoring a calcium level, especially within the first six months to a year after a spinal cord injury, is pretty helpful to make sure you're not getting too high calcium, because um, that can also contribute. Very rarely needs to be treated, though. Um, again, worsening tone can be anything painful or an infection. If you have a change in the level, so their sensory level or their motor level is moving up, that is the wrong direction, that can either be from an infection, you can have a traumatic syrinx that forms and causes issues, or you can be having some kind of wear and tear issue that's above it, like a compressive neuropathy or so forth that's kind of mimicking an ascending neurologic level. But be very aware of this and have a low threshold of getting that imaging, a CT or MRI, whatever they can get, um, to make sure there's no syrinx because that may need subsequent treatment with neurosurgery. Long term, these patients basically have a chronic illness now. That's sad, it's not just not being able to walk because they have now, they have intact motor units but their muscles aren't getting used, and so they build up a little more fat in the muscles than they normally would. Their ability to exercise is more limited. They can certainly exercise. We'll go back and look at the Paralympic videos if you doubt that, but a lot of them don't, just like a lot of us don't. So their risk of atherosclerosis is just escalated because they have part of the muscles they're not using at all. Um, and they have harder time ex um, exercising. And so they get more fat in the muscles that causes insulin resistance, causes diabetes. They have more risk of atherosclerosis and vascular complications. So this is a metabolic issue as well. Um, we've discussed the musculoskeletal complications. Many uh, patients who are young when they're injured and wind up a para and push a manual chair for years um, can wind up with rotator cuff issues and shoulder issues that then require surgery and may limit them from using a chair. They may have to go to power, which is bulkier and not in their lifestyle routine. And so, um, this, you know, the shoulder issue is probably one of the biggest. 
um, psychosocial issues, you know, are they already married? Um, do they want to get married? I tell you patients that marry after an injury have a lower divorce rate than if they're already married when they have the accident because you marry into the spinal cord injury and you're used to it. Um, did they work before? They'll probably work again, especially if they have some independence with function. Um, did they use drugs before? They'll probably use them again. <laughs> um, it really kind of comes down to their coping mechanism. If they are externally motivated, they're going to have a harder time with any kind of trauma than if they're internally motivated, and that's called resilience. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with if they're a quad or a para. If a quad was successful before, they're probably going to find a way to be successful now. If a para was in inappropriate activities and having high-risk behaviors, they're going to do high-risk behaviors again. We have patients ramp off their porches um, as a para. Um, so, uh, you know, aim high, I guess. Get a higher injury. and So, it, it, um, it's really a little different than you think. But ultimately, what I want to impress upon you is that these patients can be independent and have successful lives. We can help them with their mobility. We can help them be continent. We can help them um, make sure they get to the school they want or have the job they want. Now, you might not be able to get a construction job, but maybe you can get a construction management job. Um, there are ways to accomplish your goals. Not walking is something that we can accommodate for easily not having hand function, not so easy. Um, but most of these patients, we can have driving and going to school and being as independent as they can. Um, but it takes a lot of education and an embracing of this chronic illness um, and being willing to manage it over time. Having a good support system also is very important. Um, with reproductive health and management, there are ways for these patients to have children. Um, females have no impact to their fertility, so we have to stress that to our teenagers. This does not mean that you have in you know indwelling contraception. You can get pregnant, so you need to take appropriate precautions and protect against um, STDs and so forth. So that's usually our female um, analysis. Um, male patients, you know, may want to know if they can have children. Yes, there are ways. Sometimes that takes um, assisted devices. Sometimes that means um, um, having them have um, the sperm implanted into their spouse, like with artificial insemination, so they can still have a child that has their genetic complement. Um, there are ways to get around things. Now, this is an excellent resource for spinal cord injury patients. You're like, huh, I'm having a patient, but that I haven't heard about spinal cord injury in 10 years. I wonder what the recommendations now are for DVT prophylaxis in a spinal cord patient. This is a good practice guideline. If you're internal medicine or family practice and you have a spinal cord injury patient in your office, maybe you want to look up the guidelines for how often you should screen for diabetes or how often you should um, check an EKG or like, are there vascular complications you need to be screening for um, sooner rather than later. And so this will give you the up to date because by the time you actually have a patient in practice, some of this may be outdated, but this always has the up-to-date resources. It's also resources you can share with your patients. Um, it may also have national organizations, national recreation or organizations that can be helpful, encourage them to get involved with any sports or community activity with spinal cord injury. We have a Paralympic fencing team at Methodist. We have wheelchair basketball. There's wheelchair tennis, um, which is really fun because you can play with anybody with wheelchair tennis. You just get two bounces. Um, so there's adaptive equipment for hunting and bowling and fishing. There are so many different things that these patients can do. If you want to look on Facebook at um, My Wheels or um, so, uh, I think that's the overriding. Start with My Wheels. Uh, the Thundercats. <laughs> no, the Wheelcats. Sorry. Um, we have a wheelchair basketball team for kids right here in Mississippi, um, and they do other activities as well. I have a um, kid who's now 15, and I've seen him since he was six, and he's traveled all across the nation, and he's surfed, and he's done track, and basketball, and all kind of things. He's going to probably be in the next Paralympics in track. He's very athletic, very talented, and he has not let an injury stop him one bit, and his parents have made sure that he has the resources he needs locally. And so there's a lot of life ahead after spinal cord injury, but as physicians, we need to understand the complexity. And if nothing else, if you see a spinal cord injury, 
make sure they have a urologist. That's the most important thing and we'll deal with the rest. Um, so just some, just some guidelines because we have patients injured every year and you will see them in one clinic or another and now you'll be prepared. Thanks for listening.